I, I work on aging, and I'm not in favor of it. I, I'm trying to fix this, and I seem to be doing OK. Um, so um, I've got a question for you. Here's the first question. In fact, I've got a few questions over the next few minutes. Um, I decided when I was really young, like eight or nine years old, that I wanted to make a difference in the world. And that eventually led me into science. For several years, I worked in artificial intelligence research. And then when I was in my late 20s, I switched careers and became a biologist. And the reason I did so was because I found out that hardly anyone was working on the world's most important problem. Namely, the fact that we get sick when we were born a long time ago, and then we die. And that's kind of like not a good thing. Um, <laughs> so so I, um, you know, I, I really want to know why people don't get this. And at TED, or TEDx events, I have the right kind of audience for this, because these guys, people who come, you guys, people who come to conferences like this, ultimately you are visionaries, or at least you are wannabe visionaries, right? You, <laughs> you, 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 you would kind of like to, um, you know, to make a difference in the world. So, you know, let's look at the, let's look at the kind of things that I don't think are very controversial, that, that, that you probably all agree with. You know, you care about people. Um, you're, not, you're a visionary, right? You're not scared to aim high. You see that there are lots of people out there who are not visionaries, who are scared to aim high. And ultimately, it's not a crime not to want to aim high. You may not think much of those people, but the fact is you want to help them anyway. So, um, <laughs> let's aim high. What does that actually mean? Well. It means making a difference. Perhaps making a really, I mean really, big difference. And the question then is, what is a bigger difference and what is a smaller difference? I think there are two dimensions to that, two things that determine whether you are, how big a difference you're going to make. Number one, how important the thing is that you're going to work to change. And number two, how easy it is to change it. Those two things both have to be looked at because Unimportant things, we can forget about those, they're definitely not big. But important things, actually, if they're easy, then they're already done. Or at least a lot of other people are already trying to do them. So you're not going to make much of a difference by being just another person who's also trying to do them. Then again, there's the other end of the spectrum. Things that would be great, but unfortunately they are completely impossible, like perpetual motion. Okay, now that's just, you know, life. We know that perpetual motion is genuinely unsolvable. But the thing is, it's actually quite hard to tell whether something is unsolvable, by and large. Really hard things are actually solvable, but they're also the most important things because they're not easy. So the first step is to distinguish the two. And that's not trivial. Most people get it wrong. Most people think that hard things actually are impossible, unsolvable. That's what we need to fix. So now, what is the most important hard, but not impossible, problem? Climate change? Well, it's pretty hard. <laughs> and it's probably solvable in the fullness of time. How about these? You know, I mean, world peace, that'd be quite nice. Um, you know, prosperity, stuff like that. Disease. Fact is, everybody wants to be healthy. Being sick is seriously no fun. Hand up anyone who wants to be sick tomorrow. <laughs> right? In particular, there are a particular subset of diseases called the diseases of old age. Diseases that people in their 20s and 30s and 40s basically never get, but pretty much everyone gets them when they get to be 70 or 80 or 90. What is special about those? What's special about them is everybody gets them, because everybody avoids the other diseases. So, now, the topic of the talk, the real topic. Why is it that most infectious diseases, you know, tuberculosis, diphtheria, things like that, have been prevented now? You may not know this, but 200 years ago, in every country, even the wealthiest countries, more than one third of babies would die before the age of one. More than one third, it was around 40% in any country. That tells you how far we have come against infectious diseases. But age-related diseases, it ain't the same. We've made almost no progress. 
what's going on? What's so different? Well, is it like, you know, is it something that we can solve or is it unsolvable? First thing I want to look at is the question of what is aging? Because people think, well, there's aging and there's the diseases of old age. And that aging is this kind of natural thing that's universal and fixing it is like perpetual motion and we might as well just get over it. But actually, that may not be true because the diseases of old age, we don't think about them that way. We think of them as curable, you know, things that we can't cure yet, but we'll get there in due course, right? Wrong. <laughs> now, when you look at the problem of um, aging and the ill health of old age, most people will say, well, actually, the thing is, yeah, maybe it's solvable, but it's just so intractable. There's so many things that go wrong, and they go wrong almost at the same time, and they interact with each other and make each other worse. You know, it's just so complicated. That's what's been holding us back. Don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. It's just... Right. <laughs> But actually, that's not the main thing that's holding us back. So I'm going to spend the next minute or two telling you what is holding us back. And I'm going to start by giving you a definition of aging. That turns out to be necessary, because if you ask 10 people what, that, what aging is, then you'll generally get about 11 different answers. The thing is that people don't have a good sense of what aging really is. So I'm going to give you a definition of aging that is, first of all, it's it's clear, it's mechanistic, it says what happens in you know, cause and effect. But also, this definition demystifies aging. It tells you what aging is in a way that helps you understand that you already do understand what aging is. Aging is not a phenomenon of biology, really, at all. It's a phenomenon of physics, which is to say it's the same process in the human body or in any other living organism that it is in a car or an aeroplane or any other machine with moving parts, whether or not it's alive. It's the accumulation of damage that the machine does to itself throughout its operation as a side effect of the normal operation of the machine. Damage is simply the changes in the structure of the body that are not automatically reversed by machinery that's built in. And the body, like any simple machine, can tolerate some damage, but only some, not too much. If you have too much, you go downhill. So it's like this in a living organism. Metabolism is the word that biologists use to de denote the... Um, all the, the, the entire network of processes that the, um, that the body does to keep us alive from one day to the next. And damage happens throughout life, even starting before we're born, and eventually that damage causes pathology. And I've drawn these little arrows in this strange way to indicate what we would like to do. We would like to slow down those arrows, but actually, at this point, we can't. So here's the problem. I told you earlier that the popular conception of the problems of ill health in old age is essentially there's aging and there's diseases. So we could say it in the way that I'm describing on this table. There are, in most people's heads, there are three types of disease. There are infections, that's column one. Then there are genetic diseases, that's column two, things that a few people inherit from their parents. And then there are the chronic progressive diseases of old age. And then way out there in the stratosphere, there's this completely different thing that isn't a disease, that's the, um, the somewhat like, you know, nebulous things that we call aging itself. Sarcopenia, that's the loss of muscle mass as we get older, that kind of thing. That's what most people think. But this is how you ought to think. All the columns are the same as they were on the previous slide, but as you can see, the big black line is in a different place. The point here is that column three is misinterpreted and misclassified. The diseases, the chronic progressive diseases of old age, are not really diseases at all. They are not things that can be cured. They are parts of aging. The only difference between column three and column four is terminology. We have chosen to give some of the aspects of aging disease-like names and not other ones, and that's all. Now, once you get that right, a couple of things come into um, perspective. You get to understand a lot of things. 
First thing is, you can understand that the way that we've tried to go about keeping people healthy in old age is obviously never going to work. It's called geriatric medicine, and geriatric medicine essentially consists of attacking the things in column three as if they were in column one, attacking the diseases of old age as if they were infections, attacking the pathologies, the symptoms directly. It's never going to work, and even from this simple diagram, it's obvious why it's never going to work because the damage that the body does to itself in the course of life is continuing to accumulate, and so anything that attacks the consequences of that damage is going to become progressively less effective as the person gets older. Now, I'm not the only person to point this out. This has been realized by a few people for more than a century now, and that's why we have a field called gerontology. But unfortunately, gerontologists don't get it right either. What gerontologists do is they say, well, okay, some animals live a lot longer than other animals. They age more slowly. Maybe if we study that variability and we try to understand it really well, we might be able to translate that understanding into actual uh, treatments. It's not worked. Essentially, this is why it's not worked. Metabolism is rather complicated. This diagram is a simplified diagram of a small... <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, it is. Of a small subset of what we know about how the body works. And, um, you know, it's rather a mess. Uh, hands up anyone who writes software. Right? A few people, right. So anyone who writes software will understand that this is the ultimate nightmare of uncommented spaghetti code. There is no way... There is no way that we're ever going to be able to tweak this thing to stop it doing the thing we don't want it to do, the creation of damage, without at the same time having unintended consequences that stop it from doing things we need it to do. And that's actually an understatement. The real problem is not that this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how the body works. It, the real problem is that it's a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about the how, how the body works, which is tiny compared to the astronomical amount that we don't know about how the body works, even ignoring all the stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. <laughs> yeah, so it ain't going to happen. All right. Uh, but luckily, there is a common sense alternative, a third alternative that uh, was overlooked for a very long time until I started to point it out about 15 or 16 years ago. Rather than trying to slow down those two arrows, the, um, the process where metabolism creates damage or the process where damage creates pathology, instead, we can separate the arrows from each other. We can go in and periodically repair the damage so that even though it's being created at the natural rate, nevertheless, it will um, not actually accumulate to the point where it's bad for you. And, of course, that's what we already do, coming back to my point that aging is a phenomenon of physics. It's what we already successfully do with simpler machines, with man-made machines. This car, of course, is more than 100 years old, and it was not designed to be that old. It was probably designed to last no more than 10 years or 15. But because it's had periodic preventative maintenance throughout its existence, it's doing just as well now as when it was built. So, if it's so simple, if it's so obvious, then why the hell do I have to come and give these bloody talks? I mean, I mean honestly, um, the answer really is people are shit scared of getting their hopes up, of believing that after the entire history of civilization having failed to bring the world's most important problem under control, that finally we might be in striking distance of doing it. Nobody wants to get their hopes up. So they like to make their peace with aging and put it out of their minds and get on with their miserably short lives and, and, and make the best of it. But I say that's Bullshit. I say, that, um, I say that we ought to fight to actually uh, save some lives, and that's why I'm saying we need to wake up and act decisively. It turns out that we can. Um, for the past 15 years, I've been working on essentially this uh, dissection of the problem. Uh, the types of damage that accumulate in the human body can be classified into only seven major categories, which I'm listing on the left here. Of course, I don't have a chance to go through them today, because I've only got another two minutes and 50 seconds. Um, but the, uh, what you really need to know is that for each of those seven types of damage, there is a very plausible and viable approach to fixing it. You've heard of stem cell therapy. That's the way to fix one of those types of damage, the one at the top, loss of cells, which is just cells dying and not being automatically replaced by cell division. 
it seems very clear now that this categorization, this classification really is actually exhaustive. There's not some category number eight lurking out there waiting to be discovered. Furthermore, this is gaining traction among very elite and authoritative scientists. Uh, this is here is just a picture of our research advisory board, 25 extremely prominent and um, world leading specialists in their various areas who are very much signed up for this damage repair approach. Uh, furthermore, other people are beginning at this point to actually uh, reinvent this idea and pretend it's original. This paper came out three years ago and it's getting cited roughly once every two days by other papers, so it's really um, the, uh, saying something that people believe in, and it's identical to what I just told you. This is They divided aging into nine categories rather than seven, but it's essentially the same idea. Each of them, they have a, a particular repair approach. So that's all nice. Um, now, the question then is, um, what progress are we making? Well, the good news is quite a lot. Of course, there is progress worldwide by various scientists and laboratories around the world. Um, there's also a charity, a foundation called Sense Research Foundation, which was crea created around this idea, and of which I'm the chief science officer. This is a selection of the papers that we've published over the past few years, demonstrating our progress. So it's happening. It's re we're really getting there. It's got, there's a long way to go, though. I mean, if you get this book, which I wrote a few years ago, and which actually was translated into German, it's called Niemals Alt in German, and you can get it. Um, uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's detailed. There's a lot of material here because the fact is, aging of the human body is really, really complicated, and fixing it is not going to happen overnight. But we are making more and more progress. As time goes on, we're going to get there, but the question is how soon? The question is how soon. We actually have to remember how important this problem is, coming back to the, what I said at the beginning of the talk. This problem, the problem of aging, kills 100,000 people every day. That's roughly two-thirds of all deaths. It's about 70% of all deaths worldwide. In the industrialized world, it's about 90% of all deaths are caused by the ill health of old age. That's quite bad. Um, you know, and we've got, we've had a few, we, we, I'm delighted to say that we have had a few uh, wealthy supporters, including a guy named Michael Graver from uh, Berlin, who uh, started web.de and fluke.de and um, lastminute.de. So you've probably heard of those websites. You'll hear of Michael Graver as well fairly soon, because he's giving us quite a bit of money to get this done. But he's not giving us enough. We need your money too. We need every... <laughs> We need everybody's money. So uh, 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 the fact is, you know, think about it. How much difference do you want to make? Look at that bottom line. You can save a life with one dollar if you think about how quickly we're going to solve this. I reckon that if we could get maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars per year to do this, rather than only four million, which is what we have at the moment, we could probably get this done about 10 years more quickly. And that come, that, if you work it out, that comes to about a dollar per life. So that's worth doing. Thank you very much.